Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Changing the Climate, the show where we talk about the changing world around us and how we can make it better. Brought to you by Climate Change Realty. The only real estate brokerage that donates 50% of its net commissions to 501c3 nonprofit organizations dedicated to fighting climate change. Mark, I'm delighted to have you on the show. Thanks so much for being here. It's great to be here. Thanks for for inviting me, Ethan. My absolute pleasure. And we always like to get the podcast started with a little bit of background. Let's begin by talking about um, what is Citizens Climate Lobby to start this podcast off. Yeah, Citizens Climate Lobby is a nonprofit, nonpartisan grassroots organization, but really grassroots in the very real meaning of that, in that the almost the entire organization is run by volunteers. And uh, we believe our job is to create enough political will so that enough members of the House and Senate can make votes for climate bills that will be meaningful in reducing emissions. Yeah, well, I absolutely love that. And what is this, a forewarning, or just so anyone knows, um, I've spent a lot of time studying different nonprofit organizations, and I've been to several different meetings. Um, I'm a part of the local CCL chapter here in Boulder, and CCL is my favorite nonprofit organization. I split all the funds for Climate Change Realty's donations in 2021 between 350 Colorado and Citizens Climate Lobby, but my my heart was really in, in CCL for reasons we'll get into um, later on in the podcast, but I did want to, why don't we start by talking about the, uh, the beginning of the organization or how, who founded it and how it began? Yeah, so our founders, a gentleman by the name of Marshall Saunders, um, Marshall, had, what kind of led him to climate change is he had spent 20 years setting up microcredit loans around the world. And in microcredit, you go to the poorest of the poor people in the world. You usually make five loans in a village at a time, all to women. They start small businesses in their village. It really might be something as small as buying a chicken and starting to sell eggs. It might be building the first chair and starting to sell it. 98% of those loans up getting repaid, and then they fund the next set of loans. So microcredit has been this really remarkably effective tool for having people lift themselves up out of poverty. So that really, that was, that was Marshall's ambition. That was his goal. That's what he wanted to work on. He saw an inconvenient truth and realized that all the work he'd been doing with really, really poor people was going to be undone by climate change. Wow. And so when he was working on microcredit, he was doing it in partnership with an organization called Results. And what Results proved is if you organize people by congressional district, and if you gave them a strong structure of support, so if they did something last week, they do something next week, you actually could get Congress to do interesting things. So 35 years ago, Results Volunteers started asking Congress to increase its appropriation for dealing with extreme poverty. And, you know, it went from a few hundred million to billions of dollars. And so what Marshall said is what the climate needs is an actual grassroots organization where you'll have volunteers in every single congressional district working with their member of the House and the Senate, and that that grassroots effort would give us our best chance at getting something done on the climate. So in 2007, he started uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, and then I joined him in 2009, at which point there were uh, six chapters and 24 volunteers. Fantastic. Yeah, and I'm just, I was a little late getting to the show. He he just passed away in, in 2020, was it? Sorry to hear that. Right? Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, December two years ago, yep. Yeah, well, his legacy lives on in the thousands of volunteers that continue yep. to do the amazing work that we're going to get into. Uh, what were you doing before 2009, was it, did you say you got involved? Yeah, yeah. I was really working in the productivity effectiveness arena, most recently with an organization called Mission Control. I was doing in-house workshops for um, usually high-level engineers and scientists. My two biggest clients were Boeing and NASA. Uh, it was funny having the organization being named Mission Control, too, and doing my first workshop at NASA, where you walk up in front of the room and say, hi, my name is Mark Reynolds, and I'm the one who's from Mission Control here. <laughs> and that was the group of scientists and engineers that were working on the Mars project. So these were top-notch cool. people. Yeah. So yeah, I was, I was very much working in how could you make people more effective and productive in there, particularly if they were very busy. Yeah. Well, that's always helpful, isn't it? We can always yeah. strive to be more productive. So why why get involved with Citizens Climate Lobby? Have you always been like a environmentalist at heart? No, not really. I um, <laughs> I, I really I, I tried everything I could do not to do this. Um, I love Marshall, the honesty. Yeah. Well, Marshall came and approached me and said, "I've got this thing, and I need you to come run it for me." Uh, we'd been friends for a long time, and and uh, we, I'd worked with them a little bit on poverty, but mostly he'd seen some of the productivity work I'd done. 
And so I had a hard time understanding what he was talking about. Uh, but eventually we would have a breakfast once a week. And I said, oh, I, I get it. You want to work on global warming and Congress, and you want to work on those two things simultaneously, right? And he's like, yeah, 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 this is going to be great. I'm like, you picked up the two most screwed up things on the planet. And you want <laughs> you want to work on terrible? This sounds like a terrible idea. But at the same time, he kept feeding me more and more information. And I the, the pit in my gut was getting worse and worse every day because I'm like, oh, I thought this is bad. It's not bad. It's terrible. Yeah. So I mm -hmm. asked Mission Control for a six-month leave of absence so that I could help them build uh, CCL. I thought I would only take six months and that I could feel like with a good conscience that I'd done my part and that I could walk away and, and get back to do, raising the kind of money, I mean, earning the kind of money I needed to put three kids through college. And here we are 13 years later. Here we are 13 years later. Yeah. So let's talk about the main, um, is it a bill, if I'm not mistaken, that the organization is promoting? Is that right? Well, actually, at this point, it's trying to make sure that a carbon price is inserted in the reconciliation process. So we have okay. been working on a bill for years, uh, a you know straightforward, steadily rising fee on carbon-based emissions with all the money returned to households. We've been working that in a bipartisan way for years, but reconciliation is inherently partisan. So what mm -hmm. we've been doing is working just with the Democrats, trying to secure that one last vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, he whose name cannot be mentioned. <laughs> you know, then, uh, <laughs> see if we can get that that voted and get that across the finish line in the reconciliation bill. Okay, so let's. I I agree with you, and I think a lot of people who are very well versed in lowering greenhouse gas emissions know that carbon pricing is one of them is one of if not the most effective solution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But I wanted to ask you why it is you you or CCL believes that is the case, and how is it <clears throat> excuse me more effective than kind of other policies. I call it like what we do in the US is like a la carte laws is kind of how, how I phrase it, where we're we're pick, putting different laws in this place and credits and different mandates that so people aren't allowed to do this stuff where a carbon price would just be like sweeping across the board. You can't continue to pollute for free. I wanted to discuss that in detail. Yeah, so if you think of like an analogy of a horse race, um, by putting a carbon fee, we call it, or tax in place, what you do is you give every horse a chance to succeed um, and you get the power of the entire market going to work for you rather than saying this little piece is going to work or this horse might have a chance or that horse might have a chance. I read a book a few years ago called Black Box Thinking and um, one of the things he, he starts the book by contrasting uh, airlines from healthcare. You know, airlines, when something goes wrong, they have the black box and they fix things. Mm -hmm. Healthcare. We kill a lot of people in hospitals, and what they try and do is pretend that it doesn't happen. So they don't deal effectively with things that go wrong where airlines do. One of the things about taking the power of the whole market is you have things have a chance to fail. And that's one of the places that we learn best from is, is when things fail. So if you've got the whole market, which is what a carbon tax does, is it provides incentive through the entire market to make a transition to cleaner uh, energy. I mean... You know, as a person, Elon Musk kind of might act like a nut, but we need a bunch of people thinking like him, right? Yeah. Who are going to become gazillionaires off the transition. Fine with me. We just, what the, what the carbon tax does is tell the whole economy, we're making this transition. Those of you who are going to innovate, start innovating faster. So that really the question is, is there enough incentive in the economic system to make the transition fast enough right now to cleaner energy? And the answer is no, it's not. So that's what the carbon fee or tax is. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. And, and while we're kind of just getting into the beginning here, I do want to explain the three main reasons why I, I love CCL. And I think it has is proposing perhaps the best, in my opinion, which everyone can take as an opinion, um, uh, is the proposing the best solution, um, solution we call it, because there's no silver bullets to climate change. Um, is num number one, I love the, the market based focus because right now we have an untaxed externality. You can pollute as much as you want and there's no price on it. What the carbon tax does is it puts a price on something that should have always had a price because it's, it's like stealing from our future. Number two, I loved that it was a nonpartisan organization that really worked to focus on bringing people from both sides of the aisle into the conversation. 
And then number three is, is very personal to me. I'm a big advocate of universal basic income. And the proposed solution by CCL is to redistribute the, ta the taxes from the carbon tax to the American people. So number three is very personal. But number one and number two, I think anyone can, anyone can get on board with with a reasonable mind. So I just wanted to share that with the audience while I'm talking to you. Great. Yep. Yeah. Um, so as far as opposition to this proposal what what have you heard as far as reasons why people wouldn't want to adopt a carbon tax or wouldn't want the uh the fee and dividend system so i mean it it will make uh costs go up and that's why the dividend is so important right because you you're mm -hmm. able to offset that but you know um one of the things that the the coal industry is against is it eliminates them first uh, because that's the dirtiest pollution. So anybody that has an interest in coal, anybody who's funded by coal, coal is necessarily going to push back. That's mostly attacks that would come from business or the right, even though people like the Business Roundtable, the Chamber of Commerce are essentially for it. They've been against it in the past. You have some people on the left who don't believe in markets. And so if you don't, if you just believe that markets don't work at all and that capitalism is a failure, then you can make that argument. I, I think that you know, we obviously are on the side of the, the, you know, putting the market to work, but there are certainly people who don't believe that and therefore opposed to it because it's a market based mechanism. Do you have any theories on how to kind of reconcile those differences? Because I have a lot of friends who are, um, let's say, further into that camp. And I'm, I, I really understand it because the market has done amazing things and it's done terrible things. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how to reconcile people when you say are, who are further on the left against markets? Well, I think the, the thing that we should understand is, you know, you've seen the Six Americas reports that says where Americans are in dealing with climate change. 30% of America is concerned. They, they, they're desperate. They want to do something. They just need to know what to do. So we don't need to get everybody. We just need to get more of those people into action. We're, we're not going to win the argument with everybody. Um, so the question is, do you want to use your energy trying to convince somebody that doesn't want to be convinced? I don't know about you, but most people I know don't like admitting they're wrong. Maybe, maybe you have a whole bunch of different kinds of friends than, than I do. But, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I think that I like really where we, where, <laughs> where we focus our energy is with the people who want to be engaged. They just need to know what to do. Absolutely. So, Mark, you've been, is it executive director of Citizens mm -hmm. Climate Lobby for how long now? 13 years. And I want to ask, how have you managed to grow the organization so quickly during your time? And how do we get more people involved in this uh, fight, or you want to call it, or action, or opportunity, as I would yeah, like to Yeah, I mean, they could go to citizensclimate.org. That's one thing they could do. But I think, what you know, for many years, we doubled or tripled in size every year. That's and incredible. Yeah, at the point where we had almost every congressional district covered, that just wasn't the case. Now, the international growth continues to go like that. We have chapters in 161 countries, um, uh, so we're you know very busy expanding out internationally. I think there were a couple of things that we had going for us. One was in 2011, Rob Willer, who was at Berkeley then and Stanford now, published a paper called Apocalypse Soon, Dire Messages Are Counterproductive on Global Warming. Mm -hmm. And what his study showed is, is that if all you do is give people the doom and gloom about climate change, they, they don't buy it. And they'll even say to themselves, I think my friend who says that the planet just goes through cycles makes more sense. You can give people the doom and gloom, but what brings people along are solutions. And so we've been leading with a solution for a long time. And I think that's been appealing to people uh, because what, what Willer's study was fascinating. You would have people give them the gloom and doom talk and they'd go, I don't think Mark really knows what he's talking about. The minute that same person introduces a solution, they say, I finally met somebody who understands this. So uh, I think that that's really been key to us is uh, that we had, um, we were leading with solutions. And then the second part is we had a solution that anybody could explain. You don't have to be an economist to understand fee and dividend. You don't have to be a climate scientist. You just understand that if something is causing more problems than it helps, it should be more expensive, like cigarettes became. You know, we mm -hmm. basically made it impossible for young people to buy cigarettes. And by 2050, we won't have smokers in the U.S. So it's, it's, it's I think, both leading with, with um, solutions and then having such a simple policy that so many people could go explain. Where did you get the data that says that we won't have smokers in 2050? 
Uh, from listening to a, sh- a radio show on NPR, is that good okay. enough data? To, <laughs> data sure, play? sure. I mean, some of my I'm from New Jersey. Some mm-hmm. of my, they they love their cigarettes over there. I'll I'll just I'll just say that I know in New Zealand they just passed a law though. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but people born under a certain age won't be allowed to purchase cigarettes anymore wow. or tobacco products. So talk about um, mandates one, one way or the other. But um, in your mind, what are some of the biggest accomplishments of the organization during your time as director? And of course, I'm, I'm getting you at a very interesting time. What yeah. are your hopes for, uh, is it Madeline, Madeline Para? Madeline, Madeline Para, Para mm-hmm. as she enters the, the position? Yeah. So, I, I mean, first having coverage in, in almost every single uh, congressional district, you know, the growth of the organization, Amazing. uh, being able to stay focused. Um, we're an organization where focus is a big value for us. And then also steering the conversation around climate solutions to carbon pricing, um, coming out of 2009, I don't know if you remember, but the Democrats took a complete beating in 2010. And part of that was blamed on the climate bill, Waxman Markey, but it was really about Obamacare. But nevertheless, it scared the crap out of Democrats. And so for what they did for several years after that is they said, don't talk to us about big solutions. That stuff gets us killed. Just tell us about the little things we can do on the margin, you know, kind of what you were bringing up earlier. But mm-hmm. we didn't stop. We stayed focused on the, what we believe was the biggest answer to the problem. Uh, and we were able then to kind of institutionalize that carbon pricing was essential to, uh, to mitigating global warming. So I'm, I'm really proud that we never backed off on that. We stayed focused on it. Um, regarding Madeline, so the, the thing that I love about this organization, it's always been very dynamic and it's changed on the fly all the time. And so I never planned on doing this this long. I just think that something this dynamic, you don't stick around. If Trump hadn't have been president, I would have made the transition sooner. But I felt like you know, I needed to get the organization through that rough patch. And um, so she's been ready for this for a long time. She's been the president of CCL for quite a while. And I think what we're going to see is kind of a a new level of of functioning that that, that she'll find a way of kicking things up. You know, she's been the instigator of so many of the ways that we've we've grown and and, uh, evolved the organization. So I think this is going to be a really exciting time. I'm sure it is. And there's more and more people getting involved with the movement, more and more people getting more passionate about these issues and good on them because we definitely need their help. Um, Yeah. How how have you managed to stay motivated through a decade of trying to 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 make this change happen? And how do you deal with the, the gridlock and the corruption and all the negative press you hear about the government, yet still continue to have this faith in the system that we can really individual people can really make a difference? Yeah. So uh, you know, there's a couple of things. Um, one is I have grandkids, um, and you know, I've got to make sure I'm doing everything I can possibly do to give them a future that re- resembles the world that I grew up in. Uh, and the other thing is, is I'm not a fan of collecting evidence for why you should give up. I'm a fan of collecting evidence for why you should maintain the fight. And I think given the size of the problem we have, it's just, it's not helpful to get seduced by how messy things are. Things are messy. It's bad. I mean, yesterday was the anniversary of January 6th. That was a horrible day. In my life, that's the worst thing that ever happened in this country. Uh, And that's terrible. But that shouldn't be an excuse for why you stop. I think it's an excuse about why you engage. Because, you know, things are a problem. Do do you use that as evidence to quit? Or do you use that as evidence to say, I need to get better at what I'm doing? I prefer to gather evidence for it means I should get better at what I'm doing. How do you think more people can can adopt that mindset if they're just I have a lot of people who have a tendency towards pessimism, but they do want to build a better future still. How can someone kind of beat their own cognitive biases, you know? Yeah, that's rough, isn't it? Um it is. and you know, just being aware of your own biases is tricky. Um I think most of us think we're the one who actually sees the world as it is, you know, everybody else has got rose glasses, but we don't, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I think that like an organization like ours is, is a good place to point people uh, because we do that hard work and we, we work as hard as we can to embrace as many conservative voices in the country, as many as diverse a set of voices as we can. And that's not complicated to try and have a, an organization that is welcome to conservatives and frontline uh, people of color and make that both of those groups feel welcome in this organization. That's a, that's a tricky needle to thread. Mm -hmm. 
Have you seen um, an increase over the years in young conservatives being interested in the climate issue in particular? Oh, yeah. Big time. I mean, and the polling says that 75 percent of Republicans under 40 are don't just want meaningful action on climate. They want something like what we're proposing, which is a steadily rising fee on carbon with the money going back to households. And that, that those are actually some of the most articulate voices on this issue uh, because they don't come with any baggage. So what's going on with the Republicans over 40 then? <laughs> enough of them haven't died yet <laughs> okay f fair enough i mean yeah people I, you know you have your views on the world and um sometimes you can be really it could be really uh hard grained into who you are and then if you attack someone's ideas they feel you feel like you're attacking them which is which is a shame um how do you think we can reconcile these different – I mean this is what America is. We get together. We, we both are hard – both sides or – there's more than both sides. There's really lots of sides to every issue. But we get in there and we have discourse and we argue and we insult each other. And then eventually um, – I always say that over time the truth will ring out if we're mm -hmm. allowed to continue to have discourse. What, is your, what are your thoughts on reconciling our differences when people have very firm beliefs on how to, how to conduct themselves or how to conduct the country? Yeah, we're in a trickier time than we've ever been because of Absolutely. what happens with social media. And, you know, like I just look up and down my street. Um, there's like two houses that take the newspaper. Uh, so most people are getting news from something that's only going to reinforce their their point of view. Um, and that's a that makes the, the whole thing even more difficult. And it just means that we need to work. Uh, harder on being better listeners, trying to train as many people to listen to other people, to consider their point of view, to, as you just said, not take it as a personal attack if someone attacks something that I'm doing. They're just, they're talking about something I'm doing. That's not me. That doesn't mean I'm a bad person. Uh, so, you know, our work is kind of a combination of being crystal clear, focused on the policy, and at the same time, trying to work at being a better, bigger human being. So we're, we can be more accommodating to other views. Do you have any stories that come to mind when you think of like moments when you were working in the organization where you felt really good about um, some sort of reconciling people's differences? Um, well, so uh, let me just give you the thing that kind of had me decide this was going to be the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. um, 2009, the House is debating Waxman Markey, um, Marshall Saunders, who's still alive, Danny Richter, who was a grad student at Scripps. Institute of Oceanography is now our Vice President of Government Affairs, went on the Hill for two days. And what we were trying to do was tell people that Waxman Markey was too big and complicated and that a simple revenue neutral carbon tax would be better. And everybody told us we didn't know up from down. Republicans were like looking at us like, what on earth are you doing trying to um, uh, tell us that we should not just vote for any new tax, but a carbon tax, you know, like, are you people crazy? And so then the worst meeting of the day was actually Senator Kerry's office. And there was a woman who was being really attentive and listening to us very carefully. And at one point I saw her sh close her notebook, which should be a pretty good signal. The meeting's over and we should go. And so we talked louder and faster. <laughs> I, I remember this just really exhausted thing where she was trying to be good with us. And she said, you know, I'm just trying to get a bill passed. And it was one of the most tired things I've, I'd ever heard a person say. And so I went home that night going, we were horrible. Um, and what if we, what if rather than trying to convince people that a carbon tax was better than cap and trade, what if we leaned on the stuff I've been training people in organizations? That, you know, you got to first be a good listener, that you should start to see what you have in common with people, um, that that might be a better avenue for working people. I mean, I've done all this training with people. Maybe it would work in politics, right? So the next day we did that. And the meetings were like, holy cow. Um, and that scared me because I, I didn't want to make this my life work. I, uh, you know, I had three kids in college, yeah. but I was like, wow. Um, you know, if this could work, can you walk away from it? <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm like no, <laughs> you know, you, you can't. Um, so that was like, that was the end of the, this is the six month, uh, moment for me. Uh, there was what? a really pain. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. There was a really painful moment for me also in Senator McCain's office when he was still alive. I was talking to the receptionist, just waiting for the chief to come out. 
And I said, uh, so how's it going here? And she said, um, you know, I'm not completely cynical. I've only been here a year. Uh, and so you know how sometimes you just kind of, you don't have to say, say more, uh, but you can look at people and say, say more. And she said, you know, I wish that every American had to answer our phone for just one hour. And I thought, wow, war hero. This is how we train them, right? <laughs> Right. You know, and so that that was a really powerful insight for me because my view changed from politicians are, are crappy to we're being crappy citizens. We we've got to be better citizens if we want to ask more of them. That's a very interesting perspective. What I was going to say before is you just told the um the archetypal story of a good leader, one who has a has a call to action, ha has a realization that really can really make an impact even though they would rather go home and and hang out with the wife and kids or on the farm, but you feel an obligation to go do it even if you don't uh don't actually it's not what you want to do, it's what you uh believe is right or what you need to do. Or you have to do. Right. So, yep. thank you for your service, Mark. I really appreciate thank it. You. Um, so yeah, we did mention a little bit about how I have some, I mentioned in my most recent film that just came out, how there are some people who are less prone to supporting market-based solutions. And with that being said, I would love to ask you how you think we can use the power of markets to reduce, uh, emissions nationwide. I mean, I, I just think it's, it's the best tool we have. And there, there's a, several things in play here. I mean, one is you put a carbon fee in place to pr create incentive in the U S market to make the transition, but on the other hand, the European Union is going to be enforcing a carbon border adjustment, and Canada is going to be enforcing a carbon border adjustment. What that is going to essentially say to American businesses, who hopefully will then reach out to their members of the House and Senate, is we're going to be put at a huge disadvantage here, and we're going to be paying a tariff for these goods because we haven't incorporated the cost of uh, uh, carbon goods in here. And so I think it's not just the U.S. market driving itself, but that European border adjustment, uh, the Canadian border adjustment, I think is going to incentivize American manufacturers to tell uh, their members of the House and Senate is they need to get to work and get our own fee in place so that we're not pay giving the Europeans and Canadians money that we shouldn't necessarily give them. That's a really good response. And is that going to be on that? Was it not like a stepped up basis is not the right word, but it's going to be increasing every year as well. When does that start coming into play? The European is 2023. I'm not so sure on the, um, yeah, soon in the Canadian, I'm not sure on the date, but you know, the, the border adjustments can be written different ways. Uh, some do it based on the carbon intensity. Some do it based on the amount of energy it takes to make a product. So you can you can put them together different ways, but essentially what they're really designed to do is incentivize other countries to put a carbon fee in place so that they're not at a competitive disadvantage. Thank you, Canada. I appreciate it. Thank you, it. Canada, they're, right? They're on, the, they're on the team as well. Yep. So good on them. So yeah, I love this idea you talk about um, <laughs> um, being a better citizen, not just like putting it all like the government sucks, like it's all tired. It's a really hard job to be a leader, to be a governor. It's almost an, an impossible job. No matter what you do, people are going to be upset with you. But I, I did want to ask you, in, in your experience, what do you think is the best way to empower the individual and make them feel like they really have a responsibility? And then if they are a better person, that it will have a large impact on others. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what the best way to do is. I'm going to tell you what we did and mm -hmm. the effect they had on people. What we decided is, so we, we've got 70 staff and, and that's, you know, it's a small staff given the size of the organization. Almost everything that's run in this organization are run by volunteers. What we said from day one is, is we're going to trust you to run this organization and you'll make some mistakes. And that's fine because making mistakes when you're up to a big thing is a good thing. And so we've got, you know, over 500 chapters in the U.S. and over 600 around the world. And what we said is, is you get to go run that chapter. We, we have 60 what we call action teams, which are different things like healthcare related, um, you know, different faiths. And we, again, we said, this is your thing to run. Uh, and we trust you to do it. And we trust you to do it right. And so I think that people really stepped into an environment where they said, nobody's gonna be looking over your shoulder. We're not gonna tell you what you can or can't do. Here's what we recommend. And I think that that allowed people to really step up in a, in a really, really big way. And then the other thing is, we decided from probably a year into the organization that we would have one rule and only one rule. And that was if you met with an elected official, the basis of that meeting was admiration, respect, and gratitude for their public service. I think for a lot of people, what they said was, 
oh, you just gave me permission to treat people the way I've always wanted to. Because I think a lot of people who try and get things done think the only way you can do it is being angry and shaking your fist at people. That's not the only way. Yeah, no, I'm much more of a, a positive reinforcement kind of guy. And that's like the same uh, way of thinking when it comes to my real estate business. It's not to, I mean, yeah, I'm not, I obviously I talk a lot on the show. I'm not, this is like probably one of the most, uh, the episodes where we've spoken the most about the government. I try not to, I'm really opposed to mandates. I don't like coercion. The idea behind climate change realty was to create a better service that's objectively better than the other one. So people have the option to choose something that's better. I love that. And I just wanted to say, trusting your local chapters, Shout out Trevor Stone. We we trust you, man. I'm sure he's listening <laughs> to this episode right now. Um, Mark, I did want to ask you um, before we sign off about the, is there like a measurable benefit to calling your senator and, and t- talking to them about carbon pricing? It's uh, such a good question. That's something I want to get into. Yeah. Moving yeah. It's, 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 it's a really good question because I think this goes both directions. Um you know, one is, yes, there's a lot of evidence that calling your member of the House and your senator does work. I mean, we passed four bills last year that wow. were a lot driven by our volunteers calling their senators. You know, Senator Whitehouse said he's got 49 senators plus the president ready to sign on for a carbon tax. And that's a lot because of the amount our volunteers have been reaching out to people. And if you talk to both the House and Senate, they'll tell you they don't hear from enough people about climate change. So that matters. But let's talk about the other side of it. Um, Joan Baez said action is the antidote to despair. And, uh, you know, most people who work on uh, climate change, think about it, are pretty traumatized by it. Uh, And so what it does is it's also beneficial to you because rather than fretting about what isn't happening, you see yourself doing something. And uh, it's particularly interesting and remarkable when not just calling them, but you find yourself sitting down with them and having productive meetings. And that the aides in particular are really good note takers and listen. Um, and so it's, a, it's, it's good for action on the Senate, but it's also good for citizens. So when you say we have 49 senators plus the president, do we only need 51 to pass yes. the carbon tax? For, for, for the reconciliation process, that's correct. Yeah, can you give us an update? Uh, this is being recorded on, as you said, the day after the sixth. Uh, what's like the current update on the reconciliation process? Because I was talking to you about this months ago. Yeah, so the the current process is nothing's finalized. Uh, there's been a lot of consternation about Joe Manchin. Well, what is uh, reconciliation to begin? Oh, with? I'm sorry. So no reconciliation problem. is a process that's that's limited exclusively to budget items, and it's a, a process where the House propose, makes a proposal, then the Senate does, and then they have to get it worked out together. Um, again, it's only matters that are budget-related, um, and so it's a process that you can usually done once a Congress. It was done twice this time, uh, and what it does is allows you to get something done without having to meet the 60-vote threshold. So ordinarily... in in regular order of business, you need 60 votes in the Senate to get something passed. When you're doing a budget reconciliation process between the House and the Senate, it only requires 51 votes. And so it requires every Democratic senator and uh, Vice President Harris to vote for it. Right. So, and the idea would be none of the Republicans would flip because there are other issues in there. Even if they were on pro on climate, there are other things in there that they might be. Absolutely. To. That's a hundred percent correct. That's why a lot of people say, well, why don't we focus on Mitt Romney instead of uh, Joe Manchin? Um, right. You know, Mitt Romney might be in favor of a carbon fee, certainly indicated in many of his public talks that he is, but there's going to be a bunch of other things in reconciliation that he's not for. It's confusing, tough stuff. Well, Mark, yeah. thanks, thanks for fighting the good fight. Uh, I really appreciate. It. I, I really do. I appreciate everyone. Appreciate everyone at the organization. I love. I love. This is great. So, uh, thanks so much for taking some time to come on the yeah. show. It's, it's meant Thank the world you. to um, me. Yeah, I'll, when I leave as ED, I'll be joining the CCL board. So I'm excited to continue to have a role uh, working there. But thank you so much for having me on. Uh, appreciate everything you're doing, and uh, good to spend yeah. some time with you, Ethan. Absolutely. And uh, we're, we're excited to have you, have you around still. Uh, last question I always <laughs> just love to ask. Uh, any advice for young people who are passionate about building a better world? I think there's two things. Um, one is get into action, do something. And two is talk to the people you don't agree with and find out what informs them. Don't just get in a bubble with the people that agree with you. See if you can understand the people who don't agree with you. I love it.
Mark, thanks so much. Thank you, Ethan. All right, everybody. See you soon. Bye. So if you or anyone else you know is looking to buy or sell a home anywhere in the USA and would like to create thousands of dollars in donations without any cost out of pocket, please visit ccrboulder.com today.